Uh, and I'd just like to introduce the panel. So we've got Sarah, Simon and Ellen, who we've, we've heard from earlier. We've also got Mark Turner um, from the University of Newcastle, James Hetherington, UCL, and Alice, uh, who we all know as uh, former president of the RSC Society. Um, so I won't give you a, an opportunity to kind of quickly introduce yourselves because we're quite short on time. Uh, but I will kind of jump straight into asking the first question then. So the first one, loads of loads of votes on this. So concerning the EPSRC fellowships, how many funded applicants were part of an RSE group within a university compared to a domain specific research group? So I guess, Sarah, is that something yeah. that you know off the top of your head? No, it isn't. I've just been, I've just, I saw that question come up and I've just been having a look at it and I haven't got, I, I'll have to come back to you on that. Um, so I, I guess it's kind of touching upon the kind of the the kind of group RSE and, and embedded RSE. So if, if people have some other questions they could ask around that, then please do okay. put them on the Q&A. Can I just chip in something there, Paul? Um, yeah, of course, can James, yeah. And please shout yeah. up, panel, if you'd like to say something. I will direct things at you, but please shout up. So just on that, on that fellow's question, uh, I note that... Um, one of the successful follows in the most recent uh, cohort uh, is both. Um, they have a foot in uh, our uh, in the UCL uh, research software group in, in the new Centre for Advanced Research Computing and within our medical physics uh, research department uh, as well. Um, and you know we are very keen on that uh, hub and spoke model where roles are both. At part of the uh, the RSC team within the research computing organisation and and within departments too. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next question because I'm sure there's going to be other things around embedded RSCs kind of come up. But RSCs aren't researchers or technicians, so they lack a policy that universities can sign up to. Should the society be writing an RSC concordat or commitment that will help UK RI? Uh, support them. So, Alice, you're probably a great person to ask as former president of the society. What, what do you think? Um, I think I agree that, you know, as currently phrased, it doesn't seem to sit entirely underneath either of those, but whether that means we need an ever-increasing sort of family of, of such commitments or concordats, I'm not sure. Um, I think one of the points we were talking about in our breakout session was the fact that this rigidity of putting things into boxes is actually part of the problem you know the fact that it matters so much particularly in universities whether you're on one career pathway or another from what you can actually do um, is really a problem rather than a solution so maybe we just need one concordat with different you know different ways that people can demonstrate their level and their value within that so fixing the sort of the need for the boxes and the way that we measure contributions rather than a sort of I mean I think if this is the way things are working then either making the two boxes have clear enough scopes that it fits people or having a third one might be a pragmatic thing to do but in an ideal world not having to fit yourself into one of those boxes would be better. Can I have a show? Yes, go on, go on, James. And then I'd like yeah. to go to, to Ellen if that's okay. Oh, sorry. No, you go. Oh, no, go ahead, I James. Can't see, I can't see any hands from other panels. Your, hands so went, your hand went up okay. first, James. So you go first. <laughs> sorry. You, you were slightly first, James. So go on. Um, the, uh, so, you know, I think we need to be deft in using parts of these two different uh, campaigns to, to further our, our work. I, I think creating another one would, would be just adding noise. Um, I think we use the energy and momentum that's, that's being driven around both of these things to, to, to help our campaign would be would be what I would argue. Um, the it's a good thing that the technician's commitment is uh, attempting to be broad. Um, if we start saying, I mean, so I know many of us feel uncomfortable about being called technicians because we discuss this quite a bit in our breakout group. You know, we see, we we very much see ourselves uh, in the in RSCs as uh, both. IT professionals and scientists and scholars. We are scientists and scholars. We are we are technology professionals, um, and technicians has often had quite a, a you know a below stairs, Downton Abbey, upstairs, downstairs kind of feel to it. But we want that inclusion in the multi-skilled, multi-professional research uh, community 
to be shared across technicians and across uh, as well. So, so let's not do harm to other people's campaigns by saying snobbily, "Oh no, they're not us." Let's use it to work to to, to work together to to to. to help all the university institutions and the research funders recognize that research is now a team-based multi-professional activity. It is, thank you very much, James. So, Ellen. Um, yeah, so I just, um, I'd really echo the, the comments from James and Alice. So I think we very much want to move beyond having, um, you know, these are useful tools and they've been developed for particular communities, but we want to move to a situation where we're considering people working in research and innovation and some of the work that we've done in inputting into the development of the um, UK government's people and culture strategy is to really get that across. We're talking about people, we're talking about technicians, administrators, project managers, um, you know, research software engineers, the whole team. Um, and UKRI is doing a lot of work around um, you know, really recognising those broader outputs. So I mentioned the 101 jobs that changed the world, um, looking at the resume for researchers who are recognising a broader range of research outputs, really wanting to embed that culture of a broader recognition of the contributions to research and innovation. So we don't have these really narrow progression pathways where you have to fit into particular boxes to progress because that's not good for the system. Um, the other thing I would highlight is that irrespective of how you feel about the word technician, I know it's got certain connotations within certain parts of the community, both the definition that the technician commitment have and the definition that you care I've written does include research software engineers. So it's sufficiently broad to include research software engineers. And we know from our own experience as an employer. So for example, MRC Harwell have found that sometimes people don't identify with the technician commitment to start with, but they start to see the benefit it's having to others and then they start to self-identify and they're welcome to do that. So we're really wanting to use these existing tools that we have, but acknowledging that we will have to take particular targeted action underneath that to benefit different communities that have different challenges. Thank you very much, Alan. So I'm, I'm gonna move on to the next question just so we can rattle through as many as possible. Um, do we have uh, the non-survivorship bias case studies from the people who dropped out of RSE career trajectories? And do we have an understanding of what went wrong? Uh, so, Mark, you, you run a, a reasonably large group. Presumably you've lost good people. Um, do you have a, a clear understanding of, of what went wrong or what can go wrong? Um, I can think of a couple of examples of people who left my team. Please don't name them, but... No, no, of course, yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to... They're two different types. Um, one remained in the university, but just took a slightly different... Um, it just moved into a different team. It's still a technical post, but it's very um, outward-facing. I would say it's more uh, focused on impact in the wider economy, which I know is part of a lot of what RSEs do anyway, but it's, it, that role is very much not in research. There's very clear delineation. Um, then the other person I'm thinking of uh, joined my team from, uh, he was a, a contractor, um, which can often happen. And then uh, the way of contracting works is he just got called up by a re recruiter one day, offering to treble his salary. And uh, he, I, I, it was very conflicted. He loved the work that we were doing. Um, but when someone offers you that sort of industry salary, it's very difficult to keep them. So um, yeah, both, um, I wish them well and they let us do fantastic it's, things. It's not so much that something's kind of uh, gone wrong or kind of dropped out no. and it's that, yeah. that, that an opportunity has arisen that they've taken. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Alice, I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, exactly the same really. So I can think of three three examples where people have left the RSE team and, and in none of those cases would those people consider it that something had gone wrong. You know, they've, they've moved on to fantastic opportunities. So founding a an AI startup or being headhunted by a government to lead their dream project or moving to a high tech company to do similar work for a lot more money, frankly. And it's not, it's hard for us personally as people trying to run groups, but it's not, if you look at the big picture, a failure in terms of what we're supposed to be doing in the world, you know, part of, especially where I work at UKAA, which is a national lab, part of our reason for being is supposed to be for helping UK industry and for generally helping the the UK economy as well as um, our direct research and development activities. So in the big picture, it's not a failure, but it, it is an issue for us. Um, but it, I don't think it goes beyond a sort of normal level of churn that you would expect. Okay, James, I can see you've got your hand up, but I'm gonna let you, uh, I'm gonna leave it up and, and come back to you on a, a different question, if that's okay, just so we can kind of fly through things. 
Um, what is an ROC career pathway? Are there good examples of this in the university sector beyond one or two examples? Universities don't yet know how to deal with this progression. The pathway doesn't exist in many places, uh, does it in any? Uh, so Simon, are you there? Um, what, what would your views on this be from kind yes. of alternative, alternative, not just ROC career pathways, but, but, but perhaps from other examples within the te technician's commitment? So, so I, 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 I would agree that actually I think that for a, you know, a long time career pathways for technicians were not available. Um, the, oh, the, sorry, sorry, they were not clearly defined. Um, and I think part of that was to do with that um, lack of visibility of technicians within an institution. So when you go and ask how many technicians do you employ, then, then often a, a, an institution can struggle to answer. And so what it was, was because it was a, a, very, a very broad definition that brings with it its own challenges, uh, in so much as historically what used to happen is there was a certain time served element back in, you know, kind of you know, years gone past where you will progress through the grades. That doesn't happen now. And now what you need to do is you need to hop between kind of different roles, different projects, different whatever it might be. To, uh, to, to develop those, those that skills and experience to enable you to take the next step. That was very ad hoc. I think what there is now is there's, there's, there's a better understanding of the behaviors and the skills that were required at the various levels. And I think the piece of work that we're still working on that I think applies probably more to RSEs uh, than, than a number of others, although um, not, not entirely, is about valuing a technical specialism as against valuing just managerial. As you work through the grades, what can often happen is you kind of get a little bit more managerial and to get right to the top of that career pathway. And that's something that we're working very hard to, 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 to as the technician commitment, to value that technical specialism. Um, and so it's work in progress, but we're making good progress in particular institutions and across the sector. So there are surely parallels with, with that as well, Simon, alongside kind of traditional academic roles in that uh, those of the kind of the academic manager um, is not, not too dissimilar from, from kind of balancing technical and managerial roles as, as an RSC, is it not? So, so, so you're right, but uh, I, I think part of the problem with the technician community is that we sit within, you know, often a, a, a kind of a, a, a more structured job family role, role descriptor here or hey uh, type structure as against the promotion opportunities that are, are available within the academic community. And so we just need to uh, manage that a little bit differently but you know it's it's about ensuring that parity of esteem for the skills that people have as against just the knowledge that, that they have and it's about recognizing that okay so thank, thank you very much sam so i'm gonna move on to the next question uh, should permanent rse roles contain a similar level of self-directed time as many research grants offer postdocs there's a lot of maintenance work on long running projects that doesn't fit into existing funding structures as well. So um, maybe, and this was something that we discussed in our breakout room, Sarah, EPSRC probably have had a, a huge amount of, of diversity in, in the grants that they've received, including RSE time in, in terms of the way it's being costed and, and how those models work for funding RSE time. Would it be unusual for RSE time to, to specifically cost time for you know, self-directed, uh, self-directed learning or career progression or personal development? I think probably in standard grants, it's probably not been something that has been, um, we've been able, we've, we've seen coming through. Um, so I would probably say that's a no. And, and also the other issue is with the, if the question is um, in terms of the maintenance work, um, and things like that. Historically, we don't seem to have funded a lot in terms of maintenance. It, when we've had software calls, we've tended to fund it from the novel um, things and this issue of, of, of uh, being able to obtain funding to maintain 
um, existing pieces of software that are well used across wide communities, uh, that is something that we need to address. It's, it's, it, it certainly is, and I think it's part a different part of our strategy as, as a society that we've aimed to kind of do parts of that. But I'm just, I'll, I'll go to Ellen for, for her comments uh, before we move on, and also to James. Yeah, so it's just a broader point of the, the self-directed time, actually. So I think the maintenance point is really important, um, which Sarah's um, commented on, but also um, time for career development. So one of the things we want to do under the auspices of the technician commitment, and we will be including RSEs in our work on that, is um, kind of what do people have access to at the moment? How can we give them better access to um, time for career development? And part of that will be understanding the funding picture as well. Okay, thank you. And James? Uh, I think there's a tacit cultural understanding that number of university-based roles are you're expected to have to be able to defend the time to, to continue to do on-the-job learning and training, to, 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 to work on things that are interesting and, and, and find excuses to do that. It's very varied in ordinary RA roles, depending on the culture of the particular PI and the particular lab you're part of. Some are, some uh, PIs are much more exploitative of their uh, RA labour than, than others, as we all know. Um, uh, I think this is a tricky one to defend. My worry would be that if we were to start to formally cost it in, it would be assumed that if you weren't costing it in, we weren't allowed to let our RSEs do that. Whereas what I'm doing is I'm sneaking it in because I'm assuming it's culturally understood that people in, you know, uh, researcher roles or uh, funded as researcher roles on, on research grants are it's expected that they're spending some time going on conferences and uh, writing technical papers in the area of the things they're doing as well as the actual progress of the grant itself. Um, and I wouldn't want that to be considered out of scope. Yeah, I'm gonna so, stick to this question just, oh, just could a little I follow while up longer. With that? Yes, so go on, Ellen, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I was just going to follow up with that. So on, on UK RI terms and conditions, staff that are funded on, on grants um, uh, can have, I think it's six hours per week, I think. Don't quote me on that. I can't quite remember. But a fixed amount of time that can be spent on other activities. And we're looking at what that the guidance is around that currently and kind of uh, understanding how much that's utilised. But the reason we need to work across the sector with other funders is we don't want to get kind of a two-tier system where if someone's funded on a a UKRI grant they get that time and if they're funded through another means they don't which is why it's important to work with universities as well and with other funders. I, th I think grant guidance plays a, a big part on that and with, with that in mind watch this space because the society may very well be running another event uh, shortly looking specifically at that. Um, so I'm going to move on though to uh, the next question. Uh, so this is one from Graham. Uh, how do private employers who hire software engineers in research, for example, Microsoft, uh, which has RSEs, manage their career structures and what can we learn from them? So who would like to have a go at that? Mark. Yeah, we uh, co-located with, with Red Hat in Newcastle, so I'm quite familiar with their structure. It's not a perfect fit because they're not really doing research in the way that the example cites Microsoft, but they're put a lot of effort in over the last few years of uh, creating career pathways for people who cannot and should not be managing teams these types of people who are like deeply technical proficient and how do you get them to the top of your organization or as close to the top as you can so i think there is a lot of scope for uh boring thought from from the commercial world on on that point so they have this notion of things like architect and senior architects, these types of people who will spend a lot of time in front of a whiteboard, but aren't necessarily doing a lot of code, but they're still not managing people. Um, they're, they're thinking big picture about very complex technical solutions. And Alice, is, is, is the UK, UKAE, no, I've, I've said it wrong, U, the UK Atomic Energy Agency, is, is it more like a research institution do you have software engineers or research software engineers or? So mixture? we're, um, yeah, we're right. We sit sort of somewhere in between all these different kinds of organizations. So we have, depending on which angle you look at us from, we might look like a research organization or a bit of the government or increasingly relationships with the private sector and trying to do commercial work. So um, we have an interesting culture that mixes them all up. One problem we don't have is, this limit to progression depending on your career family so we have been able to define 
roles at five different levels. And I'm at the point now where some people have been there long enough that we're working on creating these senior, as in sort of group leader level technical roles that are at that level based on technical expertise. Um, I think what I said in the comment is these tend to be niche, you know, they tend to be like something the person has carved out themselves, but I don't think that's different from a researcher getting to that kind of level through through having carved out their own kind of unique area of leadership. So yeah, we're kind of lucky in that respect that we don't have that limitation. Fantastic. James, did you have your hand up there? Yeah, it was slightly off topic, it wasn't on the industry thing, it was a reaction to one of the points uh, that Alice raised. We, so in UCL, we've just got to the point where we've got agreement in principle from the powers that be to draw up a um, technical promotion track without uh, a line management track and without needing to you know, apply for a separate job. So an academic promotion is equivalent process for the research technology professional career families. Um, we haven't yes. implemented it yet and I haven't drawn up any of the... Uh, I haven't drawn up any of the criteria, but we've got to the point at least of uh, breaking the back of the challenge institutionally. That's really interesting. I don't want to go off topic, but I'd be intrigued to, to find out kind of how high that can go, James. So we'll, we shall certainly yeah. watch, watch that space. <laughs> I would um, just say um, we're not there yet, but in theory, I can't see any reason in UKAA why we couldn't go to the next level up as well, because there's a concept in other engineering disciplines of a chief engineer who's like a sort of point of technical authority for the whole swathes of the organization's work and there's no reason there couldn't be such a thing for software that's such an amazing title for those of us who grew up on star trek <laughs> as well uh. <laughs> okay so ne next question then RSEs outside of epsrc often appear as named researchers rather than co-applicants uh, this being the only way of recognizing their significant contribution to the work plan do either the concordat or technicians commitment offer a route for improving this situation so maybe we we'll start with simon you know, does does the does the the technicians commitment offer a route for allowing uh, people who identify as technicians to be included on on grants outside of being um, like named researchers or named technicians? Sure, absolutely. So 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 this was something that that that, that was identified. It came initially out of discussions around career development as well for for research technicians that have been funded on grants repeatedly for. 15, 20 years and have stayed, you know, approximately where they've been for those 15 and 20 years. Um, and it is, so, so it is a piece of work that we took up and uh, I'm sure uh, colleagues from the UKRI would, would, would answer in much more detail than I, but they're, they're, it is now much more open for technicians to apply to a number of grants through that and to be recognised for their technical input for their academic input into in, 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 into those grants because without those you know the research is, is, is not going to progress and it's a shame that that uh, wasn't recognized we aren't there yet we've made significant progress in that but you know it's certainly something that we would want to we, we would want to address so absolutely yes um, and maybe you care I would want to comment a bit more on that Sarah, do you want to talk about um, EPSRC and kind of the um, the technician side in terms of the, oh, I've forgotten the names of your schemes now, capital equipment and things like that? Or do you, I don't know if that's not quite your area, I can just. <laughs> not really, that's not, I, I've not been involved in the, um, in the RTP working, uh, yeah. working group. Um, oh, well, so I can comment on it then, I wasn't, yeah. I didn't want so, to steal just, your. Just, just no, before no. you do, Ellen, uh, Sarah, are you aware of many examples of EPSRC funded research that do have RSEs as co-applicants, uh, kind of outside of the fellowship scheme? Is it something that's quite common? No, not, not historically. It is something that we are trying to push um rscs are within the excalibur project we are seeing um rscs as co-eyes um on those as part of the um the new software call we're looking we are expecting rscs because one of the one of the one of the things that i know you and you you and i have talked about in the past is that um the software that we funded in the past has been large scale novel funding. What we're looking for this time is, um, or oh, the opportunities we're looking for this time is for RSEs who maybe can um, identify a smaller piece of work 
um, not hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds, but smaller scale pieces of work that will go, um, that will, will develop that software to the next phase. And that's the sort of thing that we're trying to do. Unfortunately, historically maintenance, software maintenance has never, it doesn't seem to have ever got the, the profile and the input, it's not been recognized the importance of it because it's no use as um, investing in a piece of software that at the end of a grant goes nowhere and another grant comes along and a similar piece of software is then created. That's just not economically viable. We need to be um, funding the maintenance of, of really good, strong software tools that are being used across communities and future-proofing them. Um, so that, that's what we're kind of trying to look at doing within this next software call. Um, and, and, and our SEs are um, invited to apply and also on the Excalibur, um, on the knowledge integration activities there, there will be um, opportunities for applications there. That's, that's, that's fantastic. And I'm sh sh sure I speak on behalf of the community to say, uh, you know, that that would be a fantastic opportunity for RSEs to kind of take up. Uh, Ellen, you wanted to say something before and I, I kind of um, jumped in. I'll pass over to James because I've noticed a question further down the list in which I can give a combined answer, which is around the the other councils, whether we they might move towards having fellowships and things like that. It's kind of a, a question about how the councils might Okay. move we'll, towards where EPSRC is. We'll come to that one as our last question, I think, then. James? So, I mean, RSEs have been co-eyes on grants uh, at least since 2013. Um, it, there is a big issue of university research offices not knowing that the rules permit things that UKRI are quite happy with. Um, you know, and I just, I do want to advise the community that if you get pushback on this, Make, a con make contact with people in, in, in the research councils because often your, your university offices are less well versed in this than, than, than colleagues who work for UKRI. Um, the challenge I wanted to raise on this though is a worry that I have with respect to the technician element. When RSCs appear as, uh, as researchers on grants, um, we've always historically attracted overheads, which is correct. It should be a net zero change when we move someone from being a postdoc in a in a in a uh, doing RSE work within a lab to doing it from within a a, a, a pool team, and, and my I have a worry that the excellent work we're doing on the technicians commitment is going to start to see people pushing back on uh, FEC overheads for RSE work on grants, which would be extremely damaging, It'd be an existential threat to many of the UK RSE groups if that happened. Um, so we must maintain that the risk the risk the the, the the, the FEC overheads on researcher contributions to research grants, um, even as we start, even as we work to improve the technician situation. So I, think, I, I think that varies very much by group, but yeah, that would certainly be disastrous for our group at, at Sheffield, for example. Um, so I'm not going to do the next question, which was asking about software maintenance. Sorry, Matthew, but um, I think that Sarah gave a, a pretty good answer to that just a moment ago. But we'll go on to this uh, this question that, that Ellen had, uh, had spotted on the horizon. We'll have this as our last question because we are running out of time. Uh, it's been great to see RSE fellowships from EPSRC, but it feels like the other research councils are lagging behind on this. Is there a sign of this changing? Has there been resistance to the idea of this, or is it just lack of funds? So I, I, I guess kind of same question, but not just on RSE fellowships, but the open fellowship format, is that likely to be extended to other research councils? Um, so if I um, respond on that one um, to start with, so... Um, there isn't there isn't resistance to the idea. I would say I think um, all of the councils fed into the development of of the the technician commitment action plan, which we were thinking about the RSE community while we were developing it, as well as the um, as um, the wider technician community. And um, there's real support for um, opening up the opportunity. Um, we are within a constrained funding envelope, so we, we've had effectively flat cash for the research councils, or it's like cut in funding depending on how you look at everything. Um, but there is stuff in the pipeline, uh, particularly around the people and culture strategy, where we've been considering um, kind of career development support for um, you know, those that aren't on a standard um, academic career pathway. So that would be technicians, um, research software engineers and others. Um, one of the ways that um, one, what my team does is, is work across the research councils so we can 
um, point to examples of best practice. So we can say EPSRC are already doing this thing and they've managed to do it by taking these steps and sort of bring the councils along um, so that they consider, you know, their own schemes and using their own budgets. But there's also a route through, um, you know, potentially central UKRI activity as well. So it is something that's very much in our thinking and I wouldn't say there's resistance to it um, at all in, in the councils. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So unfortunately, we are just about all out of time. Uh, Mojgan, would you mind putting up the, the, the final slide because it's got some important links on it. Uh, just as you do, I'd just like to thank, um, thank the panel Thank all of our speakers uh, today, you know, this, and, and most of all, kind of thank all of you for, for turning up and attending. It's been a fantastic turnout uh, and we've had some fantastic thoughts. Uh, in terms of what we do next, then, I think it's important that we capture some of these ideas, uh, some of the themes that we've discussed. I realise there's a whole bunch of questions that we haven't even got round to. And, and with the, the, the panellists' permission, what I will do is circulate some of those questions to, to the panellists for some offline comments and then try and incorporate that into, into kind of a summary document that the society will produce, uh, just kind of capturing some of the themes and outputs from, from this discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of do that offline if that's okay. Um, to thank you all again, just for attending. Uh, if you're not already a member of the society, then you should consider becoming a member of the society. Uh, this is exactly what, the, the, what we do as a society. We, we kind of act on behalf of the community to run events like this, things like our conference that are coming up, uh, so again, if you have uh, interesting ideas about discussion panels, this being kind of uh, a good example of one, then please uh, submit that to September uh, RSC, um, as you should also kind of see the link for that. Uh, and, and last but not least, uh, we would like to get feedback uh, from you about this event. So there's a, there's a kind of a short uh, URL there, which will circulate to everyone offline after the event. Uh, please take just a couple of moments to answer uh, a couple of tick boxes and, a, and a, a free box to feed to feed back to us as well. We, I promise we really do listen to that feedback. Uh, it's very important. So once again, thank you to everyone. Thank you to uh, participants. Thank you to, to people who've come along. Thank you to, to members of the society as well, particularly Mojgan, Terry, Marion and Claire uh, behind the scenes that have, have made this event happen. And we'll end there. Thank you.